Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias! And he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. And he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Amen. People like that shouldn't even be called Christian. Now, I won't ask for a show of hands today who has thought such a thing sometime in your life. I, I won't ask about, about whom you thought this, uh, or maybe even said out loud from time to time. Uh, but I, I would invite you today to, to think about that person, if indeed this is something that you have thought in, in the back of your mind, uh, who that might be. Put them in your head as, as you think about why, why that might be. What is it that that person or persons uh, have done to you? Maybe they uh, are ideologically different from you. Maybe they're uh, too progressive. Maybe they're uh, too conservative. Maybe personality-wise, they're just too uh, strict and, and perfectionistic. Or maybe they're too wishy-washy and too mamby-pamby. Maybe they're fundamentally different from you. Maybe they uh, have a different race. Maybe they have a, a different gender. Maybe they have a different sexual orientation. They're, they're just different from you. Maybe they, uh, they look at the Bible differently than you. They, um, they take the Bible too literally or they don't take it literally enough. What is it that they said to you? What is it that they did to you? What is it that, uh, that, that, that impacted you in that way so that you might think or maybe even say out loud these words, people like that shouldn't even be called Christian. Well, if you have thought such a thing, my guess is that uh, you're not alone. Again, you're probably not alone here in this room, but I know you're not alone from the pages of Scripture, for we see uh, more often than we'd like to admit, people who say something just about like that often and again. People like that shouldn't even be called Christian. Even in today's passage, we have a, a couple of different examples, don't we, of, of, uh, of folks that might fit into this category. Uh, now, the first is uh, Saul. Now, uh, we have to uh, kind of uh, cheat a little bit with Saul because he's not talking about Christians. He's talking about a different faith. He's talking about his own kind of denomination, his own kind of way of, of practicing the faith. Uh, but he definitely has found people that don't fit into his circle. Uh, he actually, as the, the passage opened last, uh, last week, uh, was on the way to Damascus to find those people who don't fit and do something about them, to get them on a list to make sure that they are, are either uh, thrown in jail or somehow bound or, or maybe even killed because they don't fit his idea of orthodoxy. Now, we see what happens next, don't we? All of a sudden there's a blinding light and Saul gets knocked down onto the ground and a voice from heaven speaks to him in his blindness. Tells him to get up and go. 
uh, quite a reversal, quite a, a change of a fortunes for somebody who, who, who is charging down the road, ready to, uh, to, to do business, to take care of those people, people like that. But the last we saw last week, he was fumbling into town, led by his servants, completely blind and unsure what to do next. Uh, but I would suggest that he's not the only one. He's not the only one, even in this scripture passage, who thinks kind of like this. Because next we meet a man named Ananias. On the other side of Damascus, there's a a good, faithful uh, Christian, somebody who has has given his his life over to Jesus. Uh, the, The passage tells us he's sitting in his house praying when he receives a vision. And according to that vision, he is to go and to take care of a man named Saul, and Ananias says, well, I don't know about that. After all, people like that shouldn't even be called Christian. What would you have to do with a man like that, Jesus? How on earth would you want to to take care of something like this? He even goes as far as to, uh, uh, to argue with God explaining that God does, just doesn't quite have it right about this Saul character. Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. Now, we get it, right? Ananias, Ananias is probably on his list. Probably on Saul's list to come and to be bound and taken away to be killed. So we get Ananias' anxiousness, but Very clearly, Jesus says, this is a man that I want you to go and see. And he says, well, I don't know about people like that. Enough to argue (laughs) with the Almighty about who Saul really is. And so here we have this, this, this dual situation. These, these two men who both believe that the other, one way or another, has, has fallen short. The other is, is not good enough, is not righteous enough. Well, then something pretty amazing happens. Um, throughout this passage, and I talked about this some last week, uh, really throughout this whole section of the book of Acts, there's all these stories of transformation. Um, Stories of, of people who are changed radically, these, these significant changes. We read about uh, the Ethiopian who is changed in, in Philip's midst. And we read about uh, Tabitha uh, or Dorcas who, who was dead and came back to life. That's a, that's a pretty big transformation. Uh, we, we read about Peter uh, who has this very clear assumption of who is allowed in the church and who is not. Um, Jews are okay, Gentiles are not. Uh, is transformed as he has this experience with Cornelius and he comes to understand that the church is for Gentiles too. All of these different transformation stories. Um, Will Willimon has a different word for him. He calls it conversion. But he wants to be very clear about this. Will Willimon is a biblical scholar um, and a church leader. Uh, and, and, and he writes that uh, throughout these stories, uh, conversion is happening, but maybe not conversion in the way that we often think about it. He wants to define conversion very specifically. He says uh, at least three different things about conversion. One, uh, he says conversion is a process, not an event. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll assume that processes or that a conversion is a one-time thing and it's over and, uh, you know, we were uh, completely lost souls and then we were completely perfect people after that, right? Uh, but the reality is throughout the history of the church, that's never really been the case. The, the, the early church has never really expected conversion to be a one-time thing, but it's, it's a process. Uh, the other reality is uh, the, the, the reformers, those who uh, um, kind of helped to, to kind of reinvigorate our faith, uh, said the same thing. They, they said that we are converted again and again and again. Uh, and so Willimon makes a, this point here from uh, the book of Acts about, uh, about Peter, about Peter the disciple. He asks, well, well, if conversion is a one-time event, when does it happen for Peter? Does it happen when he, he, he walks away from his nets and follows Jesus? Or maybe it's when Jesus asks him, well, who do you say I am? And he says, you are the Messiah. That's his moment of conversion. Or maybe the passage that Michaela read just a few minutes ago, the passage in which uh, Jesus reinstates him after his denial. Do you love me? 
feed my sheep. Maybe that's when he's truly converted. Or maybe it happens with Cornelius here in the book of Acts. Uh, Willimon's point is the answer to when P- Peter is converted is, is all of the above. It's, it's a process, not just a one time event. Now, those of us who have grown up in, in this generation, and really the last couple, several generations, the last couple hundred years, uh, have, have kind of been tied into this, this part of this church, time of the church, in which um, we, we rely a lot on revivalism, right? Revivalism says, you know, if you put up a tent and you have good preaching and you have good music, then somebody's going to be converted and it's a one-time thing and then it's all said and done, right? Um, but really, again, the, the life of the church for 2,000 years has been more about seeing conversion, transformation as a process. And this is what we see again in the book of Acts. Uh, secondly, conversion is about beginnings. Uh, it's not just about, uh, you know, what, what, what you've done wrong, what, what's been bad in the past. It's about what's going to happen, right, in the future. It's about the newness of, of things. Remember one of the, the words that we talked about from the, the passage last week was uh, just a little, short little word in the middle, go. The voice told Saul, go, get up, I'll show you where you're going next, right? Did you hear that again in the passage today? Uh, he had to tell Ananias twice. That same verb, that same word, go, a new beginning. And we know the rest of the story. We know what happens with Saul. We know he becomes Paul. We know about, we know about the letters. We know about the missionary zeal. We know about the, the journeys. But in that moment, all Ananias knew was this is a beginning. This is a, a go moment. A conversion of sorts. And so finally, conversion is about the gifts of God. You know, how often do we think that, uh, well, this is just about my work and how well I've done, and, uh, uh, you know, Ananias might have thought, well, this is uh, uh, my power that I'm healing uh, this man with, and, and aren't I a good Christian, and I was praying, did you see me praying, Jesus, and all that? But throughout Acts, it's not about our actions. <laughs> the, the Acts of the Apostles, as the book's officially called, is, is actually about the Acts of the Holy Spirit. This is all about God's activity. The, 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 the Pentecost uh, narrative is not just the, the preamble. It's not just the introduction uh, to the book of Acts. It's the, uh, the template for how it happens throughout the whole book. The Holy Spirit comes as, as flames uh, a fire on one's head. It's, it comes with power. It comes with rushing wind. It comes with these amazing stories of God's work, God's gifts. And the same thing happens with Ananias. Nobody thinks that this is Ananias' work. As he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And so according to, to Willimon's uh, way of, of talking about um, conversion, who got converted? I mean, if you flip in your Bible, you'll, you'll probably... You'll probably see in there, probably the subject heading on the top of it makes it clear, right? It it probably says, at the beginning of chapter 9, the conversion of Saul. But I think that's only half right. I think maybe the more powerful story that we forget is that this story, this passage, is about the conversion of Ananias. For here is a man who was living by this. Who was transformed. Who was converted. Who was changed from the inside. To see Saul in a new way. And to see Jesus acting in Saul in a new way. This is a man who who went from, uh, uh, I would never even darken the door where that man stood. going to the street called Straight and sitting with him. A man who who goes all all the way from, uh, uh, Lord, I've heard about this man, to, I've come to heal you. A man who goes from, people like that shouldn't even be called Christian, to walking in the front door, And how does he greet him? Brother Saul. If that's not a change of heart, I don't know what is. If that's not a conversion, a transformation, I don't know 
what is. The passage tells us that the scales fall from Saul's eyes and he's able to see again, but let me suggest today that the scales fell from Ananias' eyes as well. Fell from his heart. Fell from a judgmental spirit to see now this man in a new way. And look what happened. Look what happened because he did. Because he allowed himself to be transformed by this moment, the church was never the same again. Because of the missionary work of Saul became Paul, we have a very different church because Ananias' heart was changed. And so I would ask once again, who is that woman? Who is that man that maybe deep, deep in the recesses of your heart, you might say that about. And let me ask, is God doing something with them that only eyes without scales can see? You know, I, uh, I used these uh, uh, terms at the beginning of the sermon. Uh, I talked about uh, progressives and, and conservatives. Uh, and I, I, I hesitate to do that. I, I, I don't want to, to use that t- those terms very often because I think they can be a little bit simplistic. Uh, I mean, I, I, think, I think the world loves, loves to put people in categories, right? I mean, you're either a conservative or you're a progressive. You know, you're on this side or you're on that side, right? But I think the reality is that most of us in this room probably are a little bit of both, right? I mean, there's probably things that... that All of us want to see conserved. There are things that we want to see, uh, values, there are traditions, there are institutions. I mean, we're sitting here in a a 164-year-old church, right? There there are things that we want to see uh, conserved. And at the same time, I I think there's things most of us probably want us to progress from, um, broken uh, institutions, broken uh, structural sin, things that, that have been uh, cultural sins in, in our lives for a long time that we want to progress from. We don't want to, we don't want to live there anymore. And, and so my guess is all of us kind of find ourselves a little bit in both. Now, some of us probably lean more toward conserving more things, and other of us probably lean toward progressing away from more things. But the reality is, Um, if we follow what the world tells us to do, putting people in categories, giving people labels, that's where we end up every time. Whether we say it out loud or not, that's where we end up every time. And so I would offer, I would hope that the story of Ananias and Saul can give us a new way to see one another. You know, this is a congregation that, that has folks that, that tend to lean both directions, all directions, all over the place. I think that can be a, a word of hope. That we can show the culture, we can show the world what it looks like to, to not point fingers like Saul once did, like Ananias once did, but instead open arms and place hands of healing on one another. Um, there's a, a church up in Minnesota, up in Excelsior, Minnesota. Uh, it's an Episcopalian church, Trinity Episcopal. And, uh, and they find themselves kind of like our congregation. You know, there's folks that, that tend to, to lean more uh, on conserving ways and folks that tend to lean more in pro- progressing ways. And, and, and these folks all kind of do church together. In fact, they call themselves a purple parish. Get it, right? There's, there's red conservatives and there's blue uh, progressives. And so together they're a purple church, right? Uh, and they don't see that as a, uh, uh, a bad thing. They see that as an opportunity. Uh, they have opened their doors uh, to conversations, specifically around things that divide the rest of the culture, the rest of society, to say, how can we be different? How can we come together in the midst of that? How is it that we can be Uh, what they call an an incubator of caring dialogue. An incubator, a place for folks to come in. And so they they open up the the, the basement uh, doors and they invite people in and they, uh, of course, put out donuts because donuts make everybody happier. And uh, they talk and they pray and they listen. 
and they learn. Uh, Monica is one of the members of the church, and she says this. Uh, it's just terrific because not everybody agreed, but there was this, uh, a lot of mutual support and listening. The church needs to be a place where we can bring those emotions and work through it. I think spiritually we have a lot of common ground regardless of how we vote. That's the story of Ananias and Saul. Together converted, along with each other, transformed, becoming something new. That's the common ground that the early church was built on. That's the common ground that the church is still built on. And so today, let us remember, let us imagine with the eyes of our heart that that moment in which Saul came up out of the water of baptism, dripping, soaking wet, standing there next to Ananias in the water, together, together they found the peace and love of Christ in their lives and in their hearts. May that be our symbol of grace and hope and unity in these days.